Hey everybody, Mouse here. Um, I'll be showing you how to create this scene this week. Um, mostly we're going to focus on the graphs. So let me go ahead and give you a, an example of what we'll be doing. So here we've got set up a character controller and a script that's going to run the character controller. There's two different scripts I want to show you. So we can, right now we're running a basic character controller. Um, we're getting movement. Um, we've added gravity so we can jump. One of the nice things with the character controller, as you can see here, is it slides along surfaces. Unlike the rigid body controller, um, when you get stuck to the wall when you jump. <laughs> um, one of the ways, the easy ways to solve that is to take the movement and uh, use your current velocity in the jump, but then you lose control of your, your jumping, which is more realistic, but in a video game, you want to give the players that, you know, control to you know, kind of back up and land on the object they're jumping to, rather than the frustration of, of uh, getting the physics wrong and, you know, missing the jump every time. This way you can control it, just like that. It's very, very precise. And as you can see, this just is moving uh, basic directions. We're not rotating. So let me go ahead and show you the other controller. And we're just going to turn this one off, turn the other one back on, hit play again. So this is the isometric controller that comes with Uscript, and it was just a really, really quick setup. And it's a great controller for testing. Um, when I was making these health bars here, uh, I needed to make sure that they looked good, that they were um, positioning properly as the game played and things moved around. And so this was very helpful in debugging that code and really, really easy to set up. I'll show you how that works. Um, as you notice, the little capsule guy is floating there. Let me see if I can get him to, to go up on this sphere here. See how he's going up there? The, what's happening here is the character controller doesn't respect real-time physics. So if something blew up and you were generated an explosion object, this guy wouldn't get any force uh, from it. He'd stand right where he is. Uh, likewise, he's not getting any gravity. So with that other controller I showed you, we added gravity in, so he was able to, to jump. And uh, you could do the same thing with the isometric character controller. You just go ahead and take that from the other script I'm going to show you and put it in there. And you'd be able to jump. <laughs> so real quick, um, we look over here, the health, the, the way the health bars are working is there's a health value, min, max, and some other values that go in. And that, you know, we can use that to control the health of the objects. So in this case, the cube. Let's get to look real quick here. We can change the health cube by changing this variable. And since that's exposed, that means we can change it in-game or on the fly over here just for testing purposes. Um, and then I want to show you one other thing really quick here, just a, a debugging tip. And I'll show you what this does in code. But this script here is on multiple objects. So if we went into the cube, imagine we had a debug line going on all of these. It would be really hard to read multiple things that are all over each other. Hold on, I gotta stop the talker barking. Get back. Okay, so I'm back. <laughs> Sorry about the interruption there. So what I was saying is you can see how it's very difficult to read your debug information if you're working with a script that's placed on multiple game objects. You know, because right now this script for the health bars is on the sphere, the cube, and the player. So, what I've done is I've added in just a, a little toggle here, a boolean value I've exposed called debug, so I can turn it off and get relevant debug information while I'm developing from which of, you know, whichever of the instances of that component that I want to debug. So, and that's just one of those things I'm going to turn off and we go in here and I show you the graph uh, and it'll be, you know, make it go away. But uh, I wanted to show it to you before so you could understand why it was there and how this sort of approach will help you debug graphs that, you know, you could have on hundreds of characters. <laughs> so you can only just uh, focus on one at a time and read the information and, and help you solve your graph problems. So. Let's, uh, let's jump into the graphs here. So I'm going to go ahead and stop this. And I'm going to turn off the 
isometric one and put us back on our example character controller. Okay, so really quick, <clears throat> let's go over the graph. The um, player has the main camera parented to it. So anywhere the player goes, the camera goes. Uh, really, really simple rig. Um, you should probably put some effort into doing something a little bit fancier for your games, but I've seen a lot of professional games from big studios uh, you know, do overhead sort of dungeon crawlers, and this is all they do. They just have the camera parented to the, the main character. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about other stuff like moving cameras around in the future. Um, nothing fancy in the scene. Just some cubes for walls. Um, I don't know, cool little trick you guys might not know about. Um, you can move these things into place. Unity has vertex snapping. You just hit Shift V to activate vertex snapping. And so I can grab that corner there and snap right into place. It makes it really easy to lay out your environments. Uh, so when you get a bunch of snappable sort of um, game assets, you just stick them together. So I think that's pretty much a quick overview. You know, there's cube, uh, player. The player has a character um, controller on it. And the way you get a character controller as you go up to game objects and you go other and it's under physics oh sorry component physics and character controller so you'll want to put one of those on your character and this is where you get it from it will replace the rigid body there you know it has a, um, a collider of its own you see that green box in there oh, sorry, the green box the green cylinder so it'll put one of those on your your cube so or cube your character. So if we had a, a cylinder we put one on there it'll ask to replace that and you just say okay. And you can click the little book here with a question mark and it'll explain all of these values. Um, it's pretty straightforward. This, this thing's convenient. Uh, like I said, best features with it is it doesn't stick to surfaces, it slides along walls. Um, and it can go up and down slopes, it can go up and down steps, which is really nice but it doesn't respond to physics so if you wanted to push a cube you'd have to write code when it collides with something to add force to the cube as opposed to a rigid body control character which we'll, we'll talk about that in a, a different tutorial um, can interact with all the physics objects as well as physics objects can interact with it so if you know, something blows up or something hits your character it'll throw your character across the room um, that won't happen with a character controller. So just to keep that in mind, get the right character control system for the game you're working on. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to jump over into Detox Studios, use Script Editor, and I'm going to show you the graphs that are going on here. We got a couple of them today to go over, and we'll talk about the parts in the graphs that are important. And um, I'm also going to post pictures of those graphs on the form. So this will be easier for you guys to recreate from the pictures. Um, I didn't have time to comment everything, just because this is supposed to be a quick tutorial. And uh, as you can see, if we zoom out, these things can get rather big pretty fast. And uh, so we'll talk about it. And if, it, uh, if it's still confusing, you know, I'll try to make some time to go back in and comment everything and post new images. So real quick, let's talk about the debug. Because I was showing you that. What I did to help me with debugging here is I put together this little block of nodes and it starts with a boolean variable that's exposed to unity and all I did was set you know name debug so I know what it was set it to false so on any specific instance all I have to do is set that to true and it gets tested so you know at this point here we're testing to see if it's true if it is we concatenate so we've got it giving me the word center, there's a space in there so that way when it concatenates the value right here the center from the component bounds and then it just passes that through the string into the print text print text is upper left corner so if it's false it hides it, if it's true it shows it this makes it really easy for me to go along and debug and quite often when I am creating a graph of any complexity um, it's really helpful to have one of these and you know I will just take it and um, control X to copy it V to paste it I'll move it wherever I need it 
let's say I'm having trouble figuring out what a value is, we just connect it up really quick. And, you know, so I know what it is I'm looking at, I usually change the name. And then it makes it really easy. And then when I'm done and I'm happy, my graph works, all you gotta do is delete it, and your debug utility is gone. And uh, that little debug check checkbox will disappear from the component panel. So, this is the first graph we're gonna go over. Actually, we'll say this is a second graph. Let me save it real quick. I wanna show you a simpler, um, I'm going to show you the move graphs, the two simple move graphs, before I show you the uh, health bars real quick. You know, I talked about the, the difference there. So I'm just going to go ahead and load this up. It is isometric. Oops, we're beach balling. Hold on. Okay. All right, isometric character controller. Because we were talking about that earlier. <coughs> okay. This is how easy it is to set an isometric character controller. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. You have an input event, and you get these basically from your events. Uh, it's a game event, input event, input events. Um, so you get them over here, and then filters, and then the input event filters are under actions, events, filters. And you can pretty much type in anything you want here. Super useful, really easy to set up. Um, and then this is the isometric character controller, and that's found under game objects. Okay, it's down here somewhere. Isometric character controller, there it is. Um, and I've just got it set to owner. And uh, the guys at uh, Uscript made this really easy to use. You can tell how fast you want it to move, how fast you want it to rotate. And then you plug into the sockets. Um, you know, on which filtered key will cause the character to move. And it's pretty simple. Let me just drag it on there. That was the one. Let me just save this real quick. And, um, and let me show you here. Do, 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 do. As soon as it goes away. That's the one that we I showed you. You know, the, the guy was floating around. So let me, let me back up here as soon as it's done saving. And I'll show you really quick. Okay, so on our player, uh, right here, example isometric character controller. Um, all you have to do to turn these on and off, so say I've got two character controllers here, is you just check the box, and so now be the isometric character controller will be in control, and then this one here is the uh, character controller that I put together to sort of show you how to overcome physics, um, you know, to add gravi gravity back into the physics for this. So let's bring up our our U script again. So I'm going to post this graph up on the on the form, but real simple. And then we're going to go look at the other one real quick. Character controller. <coughs> okay. So this one isn't that complicated. Uh, we'll zoom out real quick here. I know it looks like there's a bit going on here, but it's not that hard really. Um, what we're doing is we're starting on update. I'm getting, using get axis, the horizontal and vertical axes. And uh, that might sort of be one of those things you don't know about, so I'm going to show you really quick where all that comes from. So, to get to the uh, input settings, you go up to edit, project settings, input. And it's going to bring up this list of axes which is actually pretty cool. Uh, an axis is either positive or negative uh, based on the direction. So you see we got a whole bunch of them here. Horizontal, and they're already set up. We got left and right buttons. The alternate for that is uh, A and D, and then vertical, which is what we're also going to be using. And you can see that this is up and down, and the alternate is uh, W and S. And What's really cool is this will have a, a negative, as you show you the alt negative and the alt positive, it will give us a positive and a negative number. So we get basically like a Cartesian coordinate axis out of it. It's really cool when you press those two buttons. It's very easy to work with, uh, especially if you're doing a, a computer game, you know, for Mac or PC. Um, and we also got jump in here, jump set to spacebar. 
and they, they've preset all of these so it, it's pretty good to know that they're here um, you can use them, you can change them, you can add your own if you want to put more and you just change the size of the array and it'll put in more blank ones and then you just go in there and, and add them so that's where the input manager is so let's get back into uscript and I'll show you what we're doing with all that so remember I said axes this would give us a positive negative number between 0 and 1 um, depending on whether uh, A or D is being pressed and so we're going to feed that into a uh, vector 3 um, I'm giving it a name of move direction here then one of the other things that's happening here and I'm going to show you how to do uh, this is the unity engine dot transform uh, transform direction and uh, this is a reflected uh, node and we're getting that under reflected the name of our graph so, so the name of our scene and then actions in this case it says it's transform so here's transform and so there's a bunch of great stuff you can reflect um, by default anything that's accessible through the scene gets automatically reflected so if you put a script you know a third party script onto a game object it should show up here automatically um, but really quick we'll jump over to that and I'll show you um, here here it is so the uscript guys have put in a really great little thing for you you go ahead and you go into your uscript project property files or uscript project files sorry and uh, there's a little folder here it says uh, uscript user types and if you look at the code that's in that uh, they give a really basic example but you can see what I got here is user types equals unity engine dot gizmos comma unity engine dot text mesh now none of these we're going to use in this example um, today but it's really good to know how this works this will cause unity or sorry, cause uscript to reflect unity classes that you don't have uh, actively in your scene so I mean you know if you click on the little book here and you go to the help section and you go to scripting there are thousands of classes Unity's provided that do just about everything you can imagine and most of those can be reflected this way so if you find yourself needing a node or or not able to access something uh, there's a really good chance you can just reflect it and it should work out really pretty much perfect in new script um, there are some exceptions and if you get errors and whatnot just let them know and they'll fix it the new script guys are really good at that <laughs> so let's get back into this so what I've done here is this transform direction um, this makes the uh, this makes sure that the um, um, what should we call it that our vector that we created here is in the same it's facing the same direction as our character as our owner so whatever direction the owner is facing us can go ahead and, and kind of like rotate it um, it makes it make sure it's in the same you know same sort of space this is more important if we were rotating the character um, and this one we're not actually rotating the character because then we would actually update this um, so it's not um, you know, imagine this is a Cartesian coordinate it's not you know one in the horizontal or one in the vertical it would rotate it appropriately so as that um, uh, the forward is still forward regardless of the direction your character is facing um, so then we're going to check the magnitude and this is kind of a cool little trick in, um, in a lot of old video games uh, your character would move in units you know one to the left one to the right if you pressed you know up and to the right at the same time your character would move faster and if we look at the grid here you can see what happens if you're moving one uh, one to the left and one up this would be the distances you'd move so you traverse this diagonal which is really like 1.427 instead of 1 so your character would move way wicked fast <laughs> and a lot of old games people would do that you run diagonal and, and uh, you're faster than everybody else so they would just zigzag but we're gonna fix that right here this uh, this block and it's really quite simple we're gonna check the magnitude 
So we're going to pull the magnitude out of our, our vector 3. And uh, that magnitude, if it's greater than 1, so you see here greater than 1, we're going to normalize it. And Unity provides this great, you know, simple math function that'll shorten the length of the vector so that way it's equal to 1 no matter which direction you're facing it's the same distance um, so voila now your guy he can't move any faster than one unit in all directions so we can't cheat and run really fast diagonally kind of break the game mechanics that way um, and the reason we're using 0 to 1 is we're going to multiply that by our speed so we're going to get into that here real quick multiply uh, vector 3 with a float and so we're going to take our move direction, multiply it by our move speed, and uh, it says 10 here, but I've changed it, obviously, to 8 on the player. So as you see here, I decided 8 was a better value. Um, so you can change that. It's really nice about exposed variables. You can put in things like jump speed, move speed, and tweak them while you're playing around and find the right values. You know, whatever works really good in your game. So, <clears throat> as we continue along here, um, I'm now going to get the components. I'm going to strip out uh, the move y direction because I really don't need that. So I just go ahead and get the x and the y. Because at this point, we're not controlling uh, jumping. We were just concerned about how is our character moving uh, left, right, up, you know, down. how is our character moving forward, backward, side to side. Um, we're going to go ahead and pass through the movement because gravity is going to change that value. So. What we got going right here is a uh, boolean. The character controller is a really great um, value here. It lets us know if it's grounded. Uh, so we can do all kinds of stuff. You know, if you're you're in the air, what what can you do? What can't you do? Um, if you're on the ground, obviously our character doesn't have double jump. So uh, if we're grounded, we can jump. But if we're not grounded, we can't jump. That's all we're doing right here. So we check the owner. We say, is the character controller is grounded? If it's true, we'll go ahead and we'll get that jump axis, remember? Now we're using the button, which instead of giving me an axis, it returns uh, true or false. So I take the true or false, and we're going to go ahead and run it through a compare. And uh, it's pretty straightforward. If it is true, we're going to add our jump speed. See right here, <laughs> we disconnected that. We're going to make our, our um, move direction Y equal to our jump speed. So that would be, you know, eight units up. That should propel us up into the sky. But if we're grounded, which would be false, we're going to skip all this. Zoop, we fly all the way over here and we get the gravity calculation. So now that we've either added the jump speed or we're just going to pass through our current um, velocity in the y-axis, we're going to calculate gravity. And that's what this big kind of block here is all about. I think it ends, yeah, gravity ends like way over here. But we'll, we'll talk about it real quick. We'll get it. It'll make sense. There's a value, Unity Stores, which is the, the world's gravity. And you can get it through physics gravity um, node. Uh, actions, physics, and get gravity. There it is, get gravity. And that's going to give us a um, vector three. Um, you know, there's a good description here in the ref. Oh, sorry, there's a bit of a description. Not much gets the vector three gravity. Uh, why gravity is all we're really interested in. Um, depending on how complicated your your gravity and your game is going to be, um, there's some crazy stuff you might do here. Um, but y, which is up, so we're going to go ahead and get the components, pull the y out, calling that gravity. Then we need the delta time. Anytime you move something in game, it's a really good idea to multiply it by delta time, which is the time between the last update. So let's just zoom back really quick. Or the last on update. So that will scale the movement to keep it the same no matter how fast your game is drawing frame rate. So that way, you know, somebody with a really fast computer, their guy isn't running around faster than somebody with a slow computer. They all move at the same speed because you're, we're going to multiply it by the elapsed time. So we're going to go ahead and do that here. We take our gravity value, we multiply the gravity value by the elapsed time, we get our result. Then we're going to add our result to the move direction y. 
So what this does is an accumulative gravity effect. So it'll burn off over time the positive value uh, of our jump velocity. So it starts at eight. We, you know, every frame we take, uh, we subtract. Well, it's, we actually add. It's a negative number because the gravity is pushing down. So we're adding a negative number um, to our y-axis. So it'll it'll start out at eight, and then it'll basically count down. Um, to zero, and that's where your guy's at the top of his hang time, and then it's going to count down to you know a negative number, and then I'll push you to the ground, and then when you hit the ground, we stop calculating gravity on the guy, because he's grounded. So that's what uh, that's what we start doing here. Uh, actually, we do. Let me, let me reiterate here. Go back. Um, we do calculate gravity because the, the ground can change. Remember how our, our um, when I showed you the uh, character controller, um, the isometric one, when we hit the, the sphere, it pushed us up and we were floating around. So we actually do calculate gravity every frame. And that just keep us pushed onto the ground, make sure we're not floating away. Um, so once the, uh, the gravity has been added, in this case, you know, adding a negative number, so I'll be subtracting, um, we add that back into our vector 3, once we, we use our move direction x, move direction z, and then the y, which is pretty much gravity plus our, whatever our jump velocity is at that time. And then we're going to multiply it all by delta time. And once again, this is to, to make sure that everything is moving um, at the proper frame rate. So, and then we pass that into the character controller. So this is a reflected value because we have a character controller in our scene this was reflected by unity automat or by unity by u script automatically and as you see it's character controller so we come over here character controller and there's a bunch of cool stuff your character controller can do um, and like i said you can get all that information you just click on the book it'll take you right to it and then you click on scripting and then it'll jump over to the scripting section and you'll Get definitions of what all these do because if you look here the reflected nodes it doesn't tell you anything um, helpful <laughs> in the reference but you can get the reference there and so we are applying our instance move and our motion and then this return value is pretty cool this will be a list of all the collisions that occurred while doing this move and this is how with a character controller uh, you would go ahead and interact with your environment. If you want your guy to push a box, we would then look at whatever we hit and we go, oh, okay, this is a box, give the box X velocity in whatever direction. Um, you know, stuff we can maybe cover in the future in the tutorials. And I also want to show you there is another one. There's an easy event here. So if we go into events and we go into, I think it is under game. Uh, or no, it should be under physics events. Here it is character collision so collision controller this is the same event so whenever your character collides with something a character controller this event is triggered and so this is this is kinda cool you could put this on a, a cube or a box and you're gonna get an event and you're gonna get your instigator and if you look over here a whole bunch of other cool stuff uh, that will help you determine what you want to do so you could put the um, response to a character collision bumping into something on that object itself. It doesn't have to be in your character controller there. So go ahead and delete that. Um, so we've pretty much walked through uh, our character controller here and we'll show it to you once again really quick just so you understand all the stuff that this is doing. Um, and we'll talk about that. So really quick I'm just going to say quick save so I can close out of here. Save quick and then let's go back and hit play and uh, real quick yeah make sure we got the right character controller activated and so here we are again so when I press WASD right, it's getting the axes and so we're moving forward we're getting a positive number in the vertical moving backwards negative number in the vertical axes and that's the that axes determined by W and S and we multiply that by our, our move speed right here, and that gets us our movement over time. Um, 
multiplied by a speed. So our character can go faster or slower. So for instance, if you wanted to make your character run, you might uh, have the shift key multiply or change your move speed, and then your guy would really haul balls. So um, there you go. Let's go back into Uscript real quick here, and let's keep going. We want to talk about everything really quick here, and then I'm going to post it up on the form um, so we can get it out this weekend and, uh, and hopefully get you guys making cooler code. All right, so that's basically how this works. We've gone over it, like I've seen the, the multiply move speed right here. So we get to multiply in our move speed. And uh, you almost see that could be anything you set externally because it's a um, it's exposed to Unity. Real quick, um, naming convention wise, you can just you can come up with whatever convention you want. Um, whatever works for you. The the key with a naming convention is to be consistent. And so what I've decided works for me is uh, since Uscript is all about visuals, I've decided to use the full names, no abbreviations, because they don't make any sense to people, and then I forget what, you know, like, MO, you know, like MD means. It, it doesn't mean anything. So I just type in the full words, uh, move direction, that way everything's kind of a little more self-documenting. And then I use lowercase and space for a variable that's used only in this graph. And then for exposed variables, I use uppercase for the first letter of each word and no spaces. And the reason I do that is, when you jump over here to the panel, uh, Unity puts spaces in automatically every time it sees an uppercase letter. And if you look up here at the name, so like the company name is, is lowercase h, and it goes ahead and capitalizes that for me. And because there's an uppercase a in my company name, it puts a space in there. So uh, that's what you gotta kinda live with there. Um, and then you see how it does a really nice job here, though. Uh, anytime there is a, a space, it puts an underscore, uh, which is kind of crazy. But, you know, you see here, it does a nice job spacing these automatically. So if you know how Unity does that, you can go ahead and name your things, and they'll look prettier here. That's all. Okay, so let's go on to the health bars. Um, really quick, let's, let's see here. Where did I do it? There it is. Okay. So, into the health bars, do, 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 do. load. Now, the health bars have got some crazy stuff going on in there. There's a, a bunch of nodes I had to make, and I'll add those into the post here for you guys. So, you know, quick overview. This isn't too big, not that, not that big of a, a graph. Um, on graph start, we're going to go ahead and create the assets that we need, and... Um, so we, we've got our background color, and we're exposed. So anything with the capital letters and no spaces in my graphs, because I'm trying to be consistent about it so I, I can tell what things are at a glance. These are exposed to Unity. And so I've got a background color and a foreground color. And so these nodes that I made here, pretty straightforward, they um, create a, a Texture 2D. Basically, they set a Texture 2D or create it if it doesn't already exist. And so I'm making a one by one um, RGB 24 format. And you know it's pretty well commented here what this does um, and all of our little features. Um, yeah, so I make this one by one image, <laughs> right? It has nothing, it's just a blank image right now. And I pass it over here to the set pixel color texture 2D node. And uh, this node then allows me to put that um, color onto whatever pixels I define here. And since it's an array, it's zero, zero is the first pixel. Um, so we're just setting the color of the first pixel to the background color, which is this beautiful red that I sampled from the uh, Unity, or from the Uscript bool node. <laughs> and then, uh, so we're making another blank image, one by one, I'm passing it into a variable called foreground. And then I'm setting the one, you know, first pixels color to foreground, green, which is a color I sampled from the uh, Uscript uh, text node. And then the way uh, Unity handles Texture 2D manipulation in real time is that you can change this uh, the texture, you can paint to it, do all kinds of cool stuff, but to save on time, it won't apply those changes automatically. 
because it would you know it would slow down the game every time you had to make a new image and push that image into the graphics card. So they let you manipulate the image, and then when you're done manipulating the image, you apply those changes, and then it only does the push once. But this can slow down your game, so it's something you don't want to do all the time, which is why we are doing it only once, and we're doing it on graph start. Um, but you could use this technique to paint the textures in real time or anything like that. It's pretty cool. So then I, I have a note here that says apply changes to the texture 2D, and then I can link as many um, 2D textures as I want to that, and it will apply any changes that have been made to that texture. And then, so now we've got our, our, our two textures, our foreground, background, you know, one by one pixel colors. Um, I'm getting some other quick calculations that we're going to use. For instance, the, the width is an exposed variable, but we're going to need half the width in our calculations. So I just go ahead and divide that by two. We're going to need the screen height. So get screen size, and those are located under action screen, and there's some stuff there for screen. Um, set resolution, things like that. That would be get resolution. Things are, are very helpful when you're working with different devices. So I get the screen height, and um, I have to convert it because it's an int, and we need a float because we're going to do division. So conversion is located in math. So actions, math, and where is it? Conversions, and these are super helpful notes. Um, yeah, don't leave home without them. You'll, you'll find yourself converting numbers all the time. It just sometimes is what you got to do, and it's really easy. Um, you know, this node comes in, and you go ahead and turn off the ones you're not using, and you send in the target. I want a float out of it, and so it's going to convert my int into a float. So there's my screen height. The next thing I need, um, these are kind of arbitrary values based on the GUI text. Um, I decided that the text height is 20 and the height of the bar is 4. And these are totally arbitrary, like you can make the height of your bar 2 or 1 or 10. Uh, you have bigger fonts, so then you make the height of your text bigger. Um, you know, it, it, this is an easy way to handle um, positioning the GUI elements. Um, but you might find a better way to do it depending on how complicated you want to make your health bars. And so the total of those I need, and I just did the math for that up here, um, because it's not going to change. It doesn't change when we get down here and we need it to position the GUI and the GUI events. So then the next one here is on late update, because I just kind of am making the assumption that uh, any damage that's being dealt or anything that's happening in the game is going to happen on update and then I can do any of the final math on late update but the reality is that this block here could be inserted into OnGUI um, and it probably should be because the OnGUI might be drawn before this is called uh, and then your, your numbers that you're showing on screen aren't the same as they really are because they could be changed that frame. Um, but just to break it up, it, it made it simple to put it up here so I didn't have to think about it all in, in one big linear block. So we're going to go ahead and calculate out the percentage of our health bar, which is going to be a number between 1 and 0 that we're going to multiply into the width to move the, the bar. Um, so first thing, we can't multiply by 0. Uh, or sorry, divide by zero, you get errors. So since we're going to be doing a division here, I'm going to go ahead and make sure that zero doesn't happen. By checking our our max health, well first we're going to check our max health. Uh, because that, you know, division by zero, our check is kind of like here. Um, first we check the max health. And uh, if the max health is less than one, <laughs> I am setting the value of max health to one. So that way your max health can't be a negative number. Uh, because a negative number would then scale our bar really funny. So <laughs> we're just going to prevent that from happening here. Um, because anytime you expose a variable to the user in, uh, in Unity, it's a good idea to do a little error checking on it and make sure they don't put something wacky in there that breaks the code. It's not that big a deal if you're going to be the one using your graph, but let's say you're working in a team and you hand this graph off to someone else. 
Um, it's always a good idea to have a little bit of error handling. That way, you know, you protect uh, the graph and you get the desired results every time, uh, even if somebody does something silly. Um, so, the current health, this is the value, you know, I just set it to 50 as an arbitrary value so we could see where it was while I was developing. Um, this is the value that we're going to use to determine how wide the green bar is on top of the red bar. So, our current health, if it is less than zero, right, current health less than zero, we're going to set the uh, current health to zero. So we'll never have a negative health number. It'll be never a, a negative one. But if you notice here, I go from current health, capital letters, no spaces, an exposed variable, to current health, uh, lowercase letters, and a space. Because I want this value to be maintained. So if your character does go to negative 20 health, he's still at negative 20. We're just going to use zero in our calculation because the negative 20 would make our bar behave weird. So we're just using this to hold the, the actual value of their health and this is the value that we need to perform math with. Um, so you see we get a zero here and so this way we can't, you know, you can't divide zero by zero you get like errors but this way we will we'll never have a zero by zero it will be always one by zero kind of thing if, if it comes to that. <laughs> um, so then the next check that we do here before we do our division is the uh, current health. If the current health is greater than or equal to max health, and if it's greater than or equal to max health, we're just going to go ahead and set it to max health. Oh, sorry, current, our current health is equal to health. <laughs> if it is greater than uh, current health, so meaning they got like 200 health, we're going to go ahead and set our maximum health value set to our current health. So that way we don't ever have the bar go outside of the, the width we've specified. It'll never be twice or three times the width. It'll always stop at 100%. So then we're going to go ahead and divide those. So it's the current health divided by the max health. And that's going to give us a number between 1 and 0. So if our current health is 100, we divide it by 100, we're going to get 1. If our current health is 50 and we divide it by 100, we're going to get, oh sorry, it's, um, yeah, we're going to get 0.5. That 100 only goes in half, you know, it doesn't go in full. Um, likewise, 0, 100, you get, get a 0. And then we can use this number to multiply our, our bar's width. And I'll show you that down here. And that will give us the size of the bar. Now here's another node um, for my personal collection that I will throw in there It's a bonus for you guys. Um, this gets the bounds and uh, you can either get the collider bounds or the renderer bounds of a game object and you know, so our owner. The bounding box is a really cool number um, that Unity stores. It's actually two vector threes but from those two vector threes we can get the center, the extends, the size, and actually what's really stored is the center and the size, but from those it will calculate the extends and the mins and the max. And that lets us find the corners of the viewable area. And the reason I'm using the render bounds is the collidable area might be different than the visual area, and I want my um, health bars to always be visually off the top of the character by whatever the offset is. So this bounding box, we get that, and then there's another node I'll include as well. Um, we're going to get the center and the extends. And if you look at the notes here, um, I, I've done a good job, I think, in trying to keep all the information I can get on this stuff uh, and put it in here so they're really easy to use nodes. The extends of the box is always half of the size of the box. So if your character was one unit tall, the the size would be 1 in the y-axis. In this case it would be 0.5 if he's one unit tall. So this gets us the um, distance from the center to the top of the box. So all we're doing here then is since they're vector 3's we're cracking them open with get component. Um, we need the x, y, and z coordinates for the center. You know where is this character right now in three-dimensional space? And that's right there. And then 
from the uh, extends, we only need the Y because we want to put our bar above our guy, our, our, our capsule guy. <laughs> um, so here, I'm adding the extends, so our, our Y axis, wherever he is in Y space, I'm adding the extends to that. So the zero, the center of the character, plus whatever the height of the renderable character box is. So now we've got the point, our, our Y here, our new resulting Y, is now the um, point at the very top of the character's renderable box, uh, renderable bounding box. So then I go ahead and squish those back into a component vector 3. And we're going to use the camera. Now this is pretty cool. The uh, camera world screen point. This is a reflected class. So if we go down here in reflected, actions, so here it says camera. What this will do is it will get us a two-dimensional um, Cartesian coordinate, so X and Y, on screen position of where this vector three point is. So it's the camera world to screen point. Uh, oh, there is world to screen point. Um, once again, to get information on this, you go click on the little help book um, in your panel, and there's a search bar when the help comes up. And you go to scripting, and you just type in camera, and you'll get the definitions because you know these reflected nodes no no information not helpful <laughs> so you can get all the help you need uh, from the unity documentation and so that gives us a vector three um, where in this case the z is the depth um, from the camera so we're going to really kind of toss that we don't use it but we do use the um, x and the y and unity so, Cartesian coordinates in, in a computer. On most computers, let's say you're doing a website, 0, 0 is the top left corner. So, 0, 0 would be up here. And then, you know, as you go further away, you know, the, the width and height of the screen would be down the bottom right corner. Um, in Unity, 0, 0 is the bottom left corner here. And so, then we go positive up and positive to the right. Um, so we have to kind of do a little bit of uh, uh, math loop to who's to get our our position <laughs> into the right place. Remember up here we got the uh, screen height. So what we do is we take the y. So in this case, we, you know, it's going to give us a positive number. You know, as, as we go up from the bottom of the screen, and we need to flip that because for whatever reason, Unity gives us the screen that way, but they draw. GUI elements the same way you would do like on a web page. So GUI elements, 0, 0 is up here in the top left, even though according to the screen, 0, 0 is the bottom left. <laughs> so all we do to fix that is pretty simple. We take the screen height and we minus our body, or sorry, body, our box Y that we were pulling off of here. So the Y value, we minus that from the screen height and that'll offset it so the GUI will be drawn the correct um, height, you know, the correct uh, Y height. So then we go ahead and pass that into our subtract. Now, this is where those values I, I was talking about over here, the total height. So the height of the text is 20, the height of the bar is 4, and I add the total height in. So we're going to put together the positioning where we start drawing our GUI box. So I'm going to subtract the total height from that point above the character's head, and then that'll get me the uh, the height, you know, minus the height of the box. Then I'm going to subtract the height of the offset. So in this case, I want 20 pixels above the top of the character's render box there. And so then that's my my new top value. And then I what am I doing here? Let's see, the the box X is subtract half width. Oh, okay, this is the to offset the width of the box. So you know, the box is 100 pixels. We want it to be centered above the character, so we're subtracting half of that. So it would be 50 pixels. Um, and that's our left position. So we get our top and our left. And then so here is the set component rect, because we're going to start drawing our GUI now. So 
the GUI, when we begin a group, it wants a rect, which is the the x, y, and the width and the height. So now I've got all my math done and all my numbers crunched. We go ahead and just jam the, the left value, top value, the width, which you know is this arbitrary exposed value. It's at 100 pixels. So we put our width in there and our total height. And so now it'll draw this group. And uh, GUIs get a little confusing. There's a lot of different stuff you can do. But um, the Uscript guys did a really good job of putting the comments um, down here in reference what do you you know what what they do what they don't do uh, you know what is a label um, some good information so that should help you and if you're still confused go to the documentation when you start a group you have to end a group and that's important to remember so here's the end so we can draw draw as many things as we want inside there but we gotta end it after we're done drawing them or we'll get an error it won't be pleasant um, so we're going to go over here, we're going to get the name of our owner. It's a pretty easy node, get name, um, this is a string, and then we're going to position a rect um, for that, and it's going to be zero, 00 in you know the top left corner, basically, of the GUI box we just made. All right, so top left corner, it's going to be 100 wide, it's text height, that we use, you know, arbitrary exposed values, 20. Um, once again, if your font was larger, you'd make, you know, use a larger value here. So that gives us our rect, and then we can use the rect to position the GUI label. And there it is. So our name of whatever our owner is, is going to be printed in that rectangle that we just made. And then we make another rectangle here. This one zero on the left. Now the top, we're going to use the height of the text as the top of this box. So you know if our text starts at 20, we're going to start just a little bit lower. You know 20 is the bottom of the text. Um, width is 100. And once again the arbitrary value that we've exposed to the uh, editor. And then the bar height, that's the arbitrary value as well that we exposed to the editor. And so that's 4 in this case. And that gives us a rect and, you know, the starting position, the x, y, and the width and height of the uh, box. And that's going to be our background texture. So we're going to tell the GUI to draw a texture. And here's where that one by one pixel texture that we made came, comes in. So see background texture. It's going to draw that pixel, and as you see, it's stretched to fill. So it'll stretch that texture map that we made to fill whatever size we've calculated here. Okay. So fill the rectangle, and then we're going to do the same thing for our, our uh, health bar for the uh, foreground color. But this is the one we're going to multiply. Uh, so we take our, our width, which is 100, and we're going to multiply it by our health percent. Remember, which is a number between 1 and 0. So if we're 100% healthy, we're going to get 100. If we're you know, 50% healthy, we're going to get 50. If we're 0, we get 0 kind of thing. Um, you know, 25 percent healthy, you know, which would be 0.25, we're going to get 25 pixels for our width out of this. So then we just go ahead and pass that in, left is still 0, the height is 20 because we're going to draw this box, this rectangle, on top of the background rectangle. So we go ahead and pass that rectangle into our GUI, this time we're using the foreground color, we're going to stretch that pixel to fill this uh, rectangle, and then we go ahead and close our GUI. And that's it. That's how this works. So we'll go take a look at it again really quick so you can kind of see it all in action. Um, sorry that I didn't have time to write comments for it all. Um, go ahead and quick save. Uh, if that's an issue, um, I can go maybe over the week when I have some free time and write comments and clean this up and repost the images for everybody to see uh, on the form. Um, but I, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, but that's just me because I understand it. <laughs> because because I wrote it, right? So let's just go ahead and play this again um, so we can look at the uh, health bars and we'll talk about the values, the exposed values we're using. So remember I said over here our offset was 20? So we could set our offset to anything we want and that'll determine how high or low that, uh, that bar is. So if we set it to zero, that's the renderable top of the character. Um, 
I kind of like 20. It looked good. Once again, they're all arbitrary values, magic numbers. Put whatever you want. Um, just so we can see the health bar working, like I said, I set them all to 50. But you can see here, I just dragged this around, and it's very responsive. I can get, you know, zero health. I can get full health. Um, so this way your players will know, you know, how badly they've beaten beaten up the cube. <laughs> or, um, you know, how their, their character's health is doing. Or, you know, you can do anything cool with this. You can fade in, fade out. Um, possibilities are endless, you know, once you get going with Uscript. So I think that's that. That's going to cover just about everything. If you guys have questions or comments, uh, let me know on the form. If um, you want to request a tutorial, please do so, and I'll try to get to them as quick as I can. And, uh, yeah. So I appreciate all your guys' support and love, and uh, keep on you scripting, and uh, good luck with your projects.